Good evening. Um, got Sunday School Lesson Numbers, Chapter 13 and 14. Uh, good bit of material. We'll try to summarize a little bit of this, though. Uh, kind of paraphrase toward the end of it. Um, but uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get into this. Lord, we come to you this, this evening. We ask for your Spirit to guide and direct us and study your Word. Help us to write and advise your Word. Lord, we pray for all those that don't know you as their Savior. If they listen to this, Lord, we pray that this will be the time that uh, your spirit will touch their heart and they'll make that decision to accept you as their personal savior. Uh, pray for each and every one of us, Lord, as we study this, that we'll learn something that we can use to witness to these people that don't know you and will encourage us, each and every one, in our walk with you. And Lord, again, we lift you up as our friend and savior, our king of kings, our Lord of lords. These things we ask in Jesus' name, and only your Lord will be done. Amen was over a little funny thing before I get started here. I was over at the uh, kids' house tonight. I like to go and see them sometimes when I can after church. And I uh, was over there and was playing with Marley, my granddaughter's uh, just in the second grade this year. So uh, we was outside playing. It's getting a little bit late. And I said, uh, you know, your mommy probably wants you to go in and get cleaned up for school tomorrow. And she told me, we don't clean up for school. I don't think that's right, but anyway, <laughs> she was wanting to stay out longer, so uh, I think that was a little bit of a fabrication there, but anyway, <laughs> she don't clean up for school, so I think they do, but anyway, <laughs> that was her story. Um, Numbers chapter 13 and 14 is, when the children of Israel came to the edge of the promised land, you know, they'd been coming through the wilderness, and they're uh, coming to Kadesh Barnea, and uh they're going to go into the promised land. And uh, this promised land is already given to them. And we'll look at some scriptures on that. But uh, they decide that, um, and I want to look at whose idea this was to go search out the promised land. They decide they want to send someone to search out this promised land. And uh, God actually condones this. We'll, we'll look at that. At, uh, and you can kind of form your idea on uh your opinion anyway, on uh, whose idea this actually was. Um, if we just look at chapter 13 of uh, Numbers, uh, it kind of looks like God has uh, just instructed them to do this, and this is why they're doing it. But if we look over Deuteronomy, we might have a little different opinion on how this first originated. Now keep in mind, they have been instructed to go in and occupy this land, and we want to look at why God told them to go in there also. So verses 1 through 3 out of Numbers chapter 13, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all those men were heads of the children of Israel. So, if we kick over to Deuteronomy chapter 1, and I want to read verses uh, 19 through 21. This land is given to them. And when we departed from Horeb, we went through all the great and terrible wilderness, which you saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said unto you, Ye are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord your God, or which the Lord our God, doth give unto us. And behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, possess it as the Lord. That's from my page. God of thy fathers hath said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. So here they're told, you know, this land is yours. Go up and possess it. Um, if we look back at um, Deuteronomy, well, uh, Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, you know, God made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12. And then in chapter 15 of Genesis, there was the the ceremony of the cutting of the covenant, and I uh, won't get into all that, but I want to read uh, verse 18 out of uh, Genesis chapter 15. 
In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt. Now notice the boundaries of this. From the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Uh, the, the ones who are sympathetic with the Palestinian movement uh, say they want to free Palestine from the river to the sea. And some of them don't even know what river and what sea they're talking about. They're, I don't know how this is coming about. They just, out there protesting, I guess, just because someone else is. I, I'm not sure what their motive is. And I've heard maybe some of them are being paid to do that. I don't know if all that's true or not. But anyway, some of them I've seen interviewed uh, didn't even know what river and what sea. Now here it says, from the river to the river. <laughs> uh, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. And it says, unto thy seed have I given this land. So... That's a lot broader boundaries than what the Palestinians are claiming and what the, uh, pro, the pro-Palestinian protesters are claiming. Uh, that's kind of an interesting little reference there, isn't it? Well, let's look at Deuteronomy. Uh, back in Deuteronomy chapter 1. And I want to read... Um, I've already read the 21... So I want to read on ahead through verses 24, and we want to compare this to what we just read out of Numbers. And here we might get an idea of whose idea this actually was. God told them to go to do that, to go search out the land. But if we look um, in verse, starting in verse 22 through 24 out of Deuteronomy chapter 1, it says, And you came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land and bring us word again by what way we must must go up and into what cities we shall come. And the same pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe. And they turned and went up into the mountain and came unto the valley of Eskol and searched it out. So it sounds here like the people wanted to do this, and uh, that's kind of the, the take I get on it. You can form your own opinion, but here in 13, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Uh, <clears throat> so it sounds like the people may have come up with this idea, and God is condoning it because he's told Moses to do this. So uh, you can kind of dwell on that a little bit and, and see what you think. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they've been told they're going to have the land. Um, so why did God decide to give them this land? Well, we want to look back at Leviticus chapter 18. That's what I want to read. Um, in Leviticus chapter 18, there's a long list of the sins that God, you know, things that God calls sin. And sometimes people don't want to uh, listen to what God says in his word is right and what is wrong. They, they come up with their own idea of what that is. Um, some people try to say, well, there's no absolutes. There's no really right or wrong. Um, at one time in our country, it was pretty much unanimous that we went by the Bible. What the Bible said was right and wrong was, was what we accepted. And now we have people challenging that. Uh, as Adrian Rogers said, the, there's a professor, and I don't know if it's just an illustration or it's true, but the professor uh, told the students there was no absolutes and uh, he was asked if he, he actually believed that that was true there's no absolutes and he says absolutely uh, that's kind of the way it is they they come up with their own absolutes uh, throw away God's word is what, what they're doing but here God gives a long list of things that's right and wrong and, uh, things they should do and things they shouldn't do 
Um, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I shall, whether I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments, and keep my ordinance to walk in them, uh, to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. A different time so he says, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord. Uh, and that um, that is a, um, you know, when you claim God as your God, the God of the Bible is your God, he is the one reigning over you. And he's telling them, I am the God that's reigning over you, not the gods, the false gods of Egypt, not the false gods that the Canaanites worshipped, the people in this land where I'm bringing you to, and I'm giving you this land, uh, they're not, these gods are not true gods. You worship me. I am, I am your God. Um, <clears throat> now we want to see just why God is giving them this land. He's outlined a bunch of things that are sin. And he's, he's telling them, don't get involved in the sin of these other nations. And uh, your parents have probably told you similar things in your lifetime. Don't go out and get involved. You know, my dad always warned me about going along with the crowd. He said, the crowd will get you in trouble. And that's, that's true. And I've been in trouble before. Um, we probably can all... Uh, think of a time back when we did something that you know we just went along with the crowd because we thought it was cool, uh, but we found out it really wasn't. And he, God is telling them, you know, you're going to be surrounded with this stuff. Don't go along with these people. Now these are people that God is going to be running out of this the the land for these people for the, His people. So why is He doing that? Well, let's look at uh, in Levit Leviticus 18, verses 21 through 30. And thou shalt not, now I'm, I'm jumped over, I skipped over a lot of the commandments that God has given. There's a bunch more, but uh, time won't permit that we read all of them. Uh, but I'll jump in here at verse 21. Uh, and this is where the, the, the inhabitants of this land was sacrificing the cho their children to the god Moloch. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy god. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is, a, a, it is abomination. So we have that sin prevalent around the world today. It's a growing thing that you know even in the olympics they this year they had the uh the transgenders competing the boxing match that was a big big news thing i didn't follow it real closely but you know i've heard people talking about it and uh and what went on and so we have this outline here is clearly a sin neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith neither shalt any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too, it is confusion. Uh, a friend of mine years ago said, you know, when this this thing come up where, you know, um, people don't know what restroom to go to, men going into women's restroom, women going into men's locker rooms, and such heavy. Uh, he said, well, you know, what's next? It's bestiality might be the next thing, or uh, they may want to condone uh, pedophiles. I mean, there has to be an absolute, a right and a wrong. And what the Bible tells us is right and wrong is correct. Uh, he's telling us here, this is confusing. It's wrong. Define not yourselves in any of these things. Now, notice here, this, this list of things, and I didn't read them all, but I, I read some pretty bad ones here. Uh, most of us would agree these things are pretty bad. I know there's some people that want this lifestyle, but this is this is sinful. Uh, notice what it says here in verse 24. 
defile not yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. These people are being cast out because they have participated in, in all these sins that God has said are wrong. Offering their children, killing their children. And you know, we're, we're doing the same thing in our country. Uh, <clears throat> and I want to add, if, if someone has participated in abortion, maybe more than once, maybe um, they have helped... Um, Maybe they're, you're a doctor that's performed abortions or worked at an abortion clinic, and there's forgiveness for these things. Uh, it's not that a person can't be forgiven for these things, but we have to call it out a sin. Uh, it's it's wrong. Um, and the land is defiled, therefore do I do visit. Uh, let me read it again. Didn't read it very good. And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. So if there's someone's going to come and live with them, stay with them, they're going to have to go by these rules. Now notice what he says in verse 27. For all these abominations had the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. The land, uh, land is, de is defiled, that the land spew not you out also when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them, shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall ye keep my, my ordinance, and ye commit not that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. So here is why God is, someone may say, well look, they're, they're taking those people's land. Well, the reason these people are losing their land is because of the sin in their life they're they're killing their own children uh, pretty pretty bad uh, I want to uh, turn over here to uh, Deuteronomy again and I should have marked it maybe but I can get to it pretty quick um, Chapter 9, he just comes right out and says it again. Chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. Speak not thou in thine heart after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land. Before the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. So when God is passing judgment on these nations that have done all these things, the Israelites are not to think, hey, you know, we're the good guy. No, we're innocent. Uh, we're, we're, we're righteous. And the God's doing this because of us. That's not it. He says, the but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before you. Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. And that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto the fathers, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We just look. You know, we talked about Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis 15, where God made the covenant with Abraham, and God is honoring his word. It's not because these people are such great people. Uh, let's see where I want. Yeah, one more verse. Understand, therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. <laughs> so God God calls them out too. Now here we got to understand that um, 
that God is not only a God of love. You know, people want to look at God as, well, he's a God of love. He's not going to do anything to me. Um, he's not going to, he's not going to condemn me to hell uh, because he's a God of love. He won't do that. But he's also a God of righteousness. He's a God of judgment. And he passed judgment on these nations for all this, this wickedness that we read about. And I didn't even read all of it. There was much more that I could have read in that chapter 18 of Leviticus. Uh, but God uh, also gave these people a chance. And uh, since... I think I got it marked. I'll just read it because that way I won't get it mixed up. In Genesis uh, 15 and verse 16, God is talking to Abraham here. And uh, this is that cutting of the covenant chapter we talked about earlier. And uh, God is talking to Abraham. And he's, he prophesied to Abraham, look, these people are going to be down in Egypt and they're going to come out in the fourth generation. He tells them about how they will be down there in captivity and they're going to come out. Um, in the uh, 16th verse of Genesis 15, it says, But in the fourth generation they, they shall come out hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So God is giving the Amorites time to straighten up, time to repent. Is God giving America time to repent? You know, we uh, we are a proud people thinking that uh, you know, we've enjoyed God's blessings and we got God's favor. And maybe we're getting to a point where we've turned our back on God and we're thinking that, well, God's been so good to us all these years. You know, we've, we've lived in this land of milk and honey for a long time. And we think, well, we got God's blessing. God's, you know, we're the good guy, like the Israelites here thinks. You know, we're the good guy. Uh, we've won these wars uh, because we're the good guy, and we got God's blessing. And, uh, you know, God raises up people. He raises up, he said he raised up Pharaoh for this cause. He showed his might because Pharaoh was a guy who didn't believe in the God of Israel. And he fought against the God of Israel. And God raised him up for that cause. And also Nebuchadnezzar. You remember how God raised him up for that cause. Um, God has got a purpose for our country. And you know, we're Israel's ally. And if we ever cease to be Israel's ally, uh, woe be to us. Um, let's, if we looked at... Uh, verses 4 through 16 out of this 13th chapter of Numbers, it gives a list of the the spies that went in. And there's a whole lot of names there that I can't pronounce, and I'm not even going to try. So I'm going to just skip down um, to verse 17 through 20. And Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land what what it is and the people that dwell up therein whether they be strong or weak few or many and what the land is that they dwell in whether it be good or bad and what the cities they uh, what the cities they be that they dwell in whether tents or in strongholds and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage, and bring of the fruit of the land. Now the time was at the time of the first ripe grapes. So in all this, uh, they're just going up and searching out the land. They're seeing what the people's like, what kind of homes they live in, uh, if, what the land is like, does it, does it have wood, uh, you know, is it, a lot of land that's doing well, fertile land. They're just basically checking out um, where they're going. Now, did he anywhere say, hey, um, check out this, this land and see if we're able to subdue this land? They were never asked to go and look at it and see if they could conquer it. They're just looking to see what it's like. 
Uh, and you think about it, well, they uh, have been in Egypt for all that time, you know, um, somewhere around 400 years. I can't remember if it's 400, 430, something like that, whatever it was, maybe 400. Uh, I can't remember the exact number, sorry. <clears throat> but um, so they're in, they're in Egypt, and uh, I don't know if they were able to get word of what this land was like up here. Uh, they, they, the slaves, they probably wouldn't do them as traveling, was it? So, um, how long they were actually slaves in Egypt, I'm not sure. You know, there was the time of Joseph. Um, so, at that time, I guess they weren't exactly slaves. So, at what time they were exactly enslaved, I'm not just sure. So, uh, uh, my understanding is when Joseph was the ruler, they weren't really enslaved. Uh, let's look at um, verse 25. And they returned from searching the land after 40 days. So they went into the land. They brought back in verse 25. Uh, and they came unto the brook Eshcol and cut down from thence a branch of, with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff. And they brought the palm of the pomegranates and of the, of the figs. So um, one a, a branch with one cluster of grapes. That's quite a cluster of grapes if it, if it took two to carry. It sounds like it is anyway. Pomegranates and figs they brought back. So they went and they searched out the land for 40 days. It's, it's a pretty long time, you'd think, to go up there and, and uh, not bring any suspicion upon yourself and... Uh, I don't know just how they did that, but if they just went up and just kind of lived like everyone else and kind of just blended in, or I don't know really how they spied out the land. Uh, but they brought back some of the, the food from the land, the pomegranates and figs and that cluster of grapes. So they, they bring back the report now. And let's look at verses 26 through 29. They, bring, they tell the good, bad, and ugly, I guess. And he went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them and said, We came into the land whether thou sentest us, sentest, uh, it's hard to say, sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people will be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities were walled and very great, and moreover we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So they say, well, this is a great land. It's, it's fertile. You know, it's flows with milk and honey. But there's people there. And, uh, you know, some of these people are big, is what they're thinking. Uh, I'm talking about the children of Anak and all the, the different ones that live in different areas. So the land was, was, seems to be pretty well inhabited. So it sounds like there may not have been a spot for them to just go up into. And yeah, you know, there's quite a few people uh, came out of Egypt. So they're telling them, you know, this land is inhabited. You know, there's, you know, I guess maybe they might have been hoping that there had been a spot there for them. But it don't sound like it the way I, I haven't really studied this out geographically to see how much it was actually occupied. But it sounds like quite a lot. So... Now Joshua is going to speak up. Um, now remember the inhabitants of the land was wicked. So that will be kind of a deterrent. But think about the inhabitants of the land being wicked. But yet it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, in the United States here. And I love my country, but our country is turning wicked. It's, you know, we're allowing things that are just absolutely insane. 
like we, we've talked about. Uh, the abortion issue, it's a biggie. Um, the uh, transgender thing and the homosexuality is, is tremendous. People, it's like the lady who, um, I think her husband who were Christians, they didn't want to uh, make a wedding cake for a, a same-sex marriage. And uh, they were, the legal action was brought against them. Now, they could have went and got a cake somewhere else if they wanted, but they wanted to make a point with those people and cause trouble with those people. Uh, you know, that's not having respect. And you talk about being inclusive. Well, that's not being inclusive to these people's religious beliefs. And uh, as far as the homosexual issue, uh, the Muslims have, uh, they don't believe in it either. And they're they're harsh. <laughs> that I mean, if they go over there, they're liable to lose their life. Uh, you know, America is a land flowing with milk and honey, and these people here were wicked people, and they were they were being blessed by God. Um, you know, God at times are is his blessing is you know he makes it rain upon the just and the unjust. A lot of times, these people have the blessing of God, and it's. God showing them that, hey, I, I am the true and living God. Um, the, the evidence is there for them, even though they have some sinful actions. And they may realize they're doing something sinful, but yet God is blessing them and showing them that, hey, you need to turn to me. I'm the one, do, I'm the one giving you this blessing. You've not got it because of your sinful actions. These people were blessed here in this land, even though they were sinful. And we need to take note of that, that God's blessing upon America may be because we're Israel's ally. <laughs> and that, that may be the only reason for right now. Uh, you know, we hope our country turns around. We really do. But um, we're, we're going to have to see some, some real big changes made for it to happen. Um, let's look at verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. So the report that the spies are brought back, uh, you know, there, there's some truth in it. Nevertheless, there's people, nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And they go on about the, the people that, that occupy this land. These people are strong people. And Caleb tells them, look, we're able to do this. Well, is that true? Um, is that true or false? Well, uh, if we look at, I want to go back over to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 11, uh, verses 22 through 28. Caleb's saying, hey, we're able to do this. <clears throat> so in verse 22 says, For if ye, dil if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations, from before you, and you shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. Every place whereon the sole of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness, now notice the, there's some more boundaries given here from where they're going to be. From the wilderness and, and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the utter, uttermost sea shall you, your coast be. There shall no man be able to, to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon, as he has said unto you. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Now notice God is going to fight for these people. He's giving them the land, and we notice because these people are wicked people, they're going to be conquered people. But he's telling the Israelites, you know, you, there's some conditions here. You have to keep my commandments. You have to worship me. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you, shall, if you obey 
the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods, small g gods, that is, which ye have not known. So God is telling him, look, um, if you will keep my commandments, you will worship me, then I will give you this land. But if you don't, then there's going to be problems. You know, there's just going to be judgment on you too. You're, you're not going to be any better than these people. You're not going to get away with it. These people aren't getting away with their, their sinful life, and you're not either. And we are not in America either. Uh, you can also check, um, if you want some other references on this, you can check out Deuteronomy chapter 7 and Deuteronomy chapter 9. Uh, let's look at 31 through 33. Now, um, they've been told they're going to occupy uh, nations greater than them. And that's what Deuteronomy says. You know, what it said in the book of Deuteronomy. Now let's look at uh, 31 through 33 in chapter uh, 13 of Numbers. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Was that true? Well, it is. But God said, You'll occupy a nation stronger than you. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Um, we're talking Sunday school today. Um, Friend asked the question, is that literal, literal or is that just uh, kind of like a figurative speech? I think it's a figurative speech there. But it, they're saying that, you know, we just, we look so teeny, so unable. And the truth is, they are not able within themselves. But with God fighting for them, they're more than able. Um, Caleb says, for we are well able to overcome it because God has already promised this land to him. He's given them this land. It's a done deal. All they got to do is go up there and, and take the land. By themselves, they could not take the land. But and we'll see that in just a minute. But let's go over to Numbers uh, 14, verses 1 through 4. Now notice, notice the, the majority here is giving a bad report. You know, we can't do this. You know, we can't, we can't do this. And uh, notice how they turn against uh, God and um, how the, the peer pressure. Of the, these were heads of the tribes. I don't know exactly um, what their title would have been, but they were kind of uh, the upper echelon of, the, of their tribe. Uh, the way it... The term it uses here, um, all these, all those men were he heads of the children of Israel. Now I don't know just what kind of a, uh, authority they would have had. Um, I didn't do a lot of research on that, but so these these people had some influence, and they influenced these people in the wrong way. Let's look at verses one through four out of chapter fourteen, and all the congregation lifted up their voice. And cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt? Or would God we had died in this wilderness? Now notice what they say against God now. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey, were it not better for us to to return to Egypt. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Now they're talking against God here. They're just saying, well, they, you know, God brought us up here to kill us. That's basically what they're saying. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword? And they're saying that, you know, the wives and their children is going to be a prey. 
So they're wanting to get them another leader. Uh, rebel against Moses, God's chosen leader, and return to Egypt. Uh, so let's look at verses 5 through 10. Now Joshua and Caleb, they, they try to, to talk some sense into these people. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, if I pronounce it right, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But the congregation bade stone them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. Now notice what's happened here. Joshua and Caleb has told us, so look, the Lord's on our side. The Lord's not on their side. That's the difference. I'm kind of paraphrasing here. That's the difference. You know, we are able because we have God on our side. Now, it's true. They can't defeat them without God on their side. But Joshua and Caleb has tried to talk some sense into these people. Telling them, you know, uh, these people are bred, they are bred for us. Their defenses depart from them, and the Lord is with us. And he, they're trying to tell them, don't rebel against God. Don't go against God's plan here. And they're wanting to stone them now. But then the God shows up at the tabernacle. And, uh, you know, Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. And uh, I don't know if they were praying there. I, I'm not sure just what they done. Possibly they were. Um, let's see where we want to go now. Uh, 11 and 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe, believe me? For all the signs which I showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. So God has made a proposal to Moses. Hey, I'll make a nation of you. I'll smite these people with the pestilence. You know, God has showed them all the the miracles coming up out of Egypt. How he defeated the gods of the Egyptians. <clears throat> He's helped them in battle um, as they came up out of the uh, out of Egypt. And uh, I can't remember exactly what skirmish it was. They, uh, I was talking about at Sunday school today, and I, I, I'm, I should have reviewed that, but I, I can't remember just what it was. But you know, God, God had fought for them as they encountered some opposition coming out of Egypt. And of course, God defeated the Egyptians. They seen the Red Sea part. I mean, you know, this is this is tremendous stuff. And now they've seen even more, seen even more. Um, they're they're here to the. Uh, the edge of the promised land, uh, of, the, of that part of the promised land. And they've never occupied all the promised land yet. That, that's not been totally fulfilled yet. That's, that's for the future. But um, here they, they've been fed through the wilderness with manna and quail. Uh, they've, they've seen all of this that God has done for them. So they're even more responsible now than they were back in Egypt. Uh, so Moses is going to plead for the people and this is kind of interesting how this words this and I you know it kind of sounds like Moses is telling God something but he's not <laughs> he's not informing God I think this is uh, I kind of take this as this is more for our education than it was you know, Moses is not educating God but it shows us the heart of Moses. God has made an offer to Moses here. I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them. I will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. So that's a pretty impressive proposal. 
But Moses, you see what Moses is more concerned about as we read this. We'll read uh, verses 13 through 16. And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they have heard that thou art Lord. That thou, um, they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, and that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that they, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you remember further along in the story, when they're coming over to Jericho, and Joshua is leading them, Moses has, has died. The people of Jericho knew about the red, what happened um, in Egypt with the children of Israel. That news is carried all the way up there, and they know about that. And Moses is telling God, you know, if, if you don't bring these people in, you destroy these people, then the Egyptians are going to going to know about that. Well, God, God didn't need him to tell him that. God knows what's going on. Um, now, if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which thou swear unto them. Therefore he has slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of thy Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering, and of great mercy, forgiving the iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the, the guilty, visiting the, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy, as thou hast forgiven thy people from Egypt even until now. What does God do? And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. But now, Moses could have accepted God's offer, um, but I think God knew that he wouldn't. And this is a, a picture to us how that Moses is more interested in God's reputation than he is his own. God, Moses could have had a great reputation of being a, a, a nation that God uh, uh, developed and Built, made him and his family into a great nation. But Moses refuses that, and he, Moses is more interested in God's reputation, in bringing and his reputation not being slandered among the nations as failing to bring these people up out of the land of Egypt into the land that he said he would do. Now, if thou, kill, if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swore unto them, therefore hath he slain them in the wilderness. Moses is afraid of, uh, Moses is more interested in God's reputation being upheld. So I think this is, you know, Moses is not telling God something here. He's not educating God. <laughs> but this, this shows us the true heart of Moses and uh, is an example of the attitude that we should have also. Um, so now they're going to wind up going back to the wilderness, 20 through 25. And the Lord said, I have pardoned thee according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither sh shall any of them that provoke me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with, it, with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein he went, and his seed shall possess it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow turn ye, turn you, and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. So now they are destined to turn back. 
not not head toward the, the land of Canaan. Um, let's look at verses 29 through 34 now. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from twenty years old and upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, if I, I hope I got that right, and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land of which ye have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms, until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which ye search the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall ye bear your iniquities, even forty years, and, shall, and ye shall know the breach of my promise. I, the Lord, have said, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. So the, the ones that they said would be a prey will be the, the ones who would inherit this land. Now, he, he talks about uh, the ones that are numbered. Let's see. Your carcass shall fall in the wilderness, and all that were numbered of you, now notice that, all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me, the ones from 20 years old and upward that have murmured against him. So if we look in Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter 1 and verse 49, something to think about. I haven't studied about this a lot, but I've heard this mentioned before. It seemed like a long time ago, and I can't remember where and when, but it seemed like on the radio someone was talking about this. Only thou, and this is when they were numbering the people. And I'm not going to read this whole chapter, just one verse here. Only thou shalt not number the tribe of Levi, neither take the sum of them among the children of Israel. So it sounds like the Levites uh, might have been exempt from, from this. Like, you know, the Levites' carcass wasn't necessarily going to fall in the wilderness. I'm sure maybe some did because, you know, their age or something. But it seems like this, um, this punishment wasn't placed upon the Levites. They weren't numbered. Uh, that's something to think about. I haven't studied greatly into that, but you can uh, you can roll that around in your mind a little bit. It says here, the ones who are numbered from 20 years old and upward, which have murmured against me. So uh, maybe God was going to uh, do this in order of a, way, a good way to preserve the, the Levitical uh, priesthood. Uh, I don't know. That's, that's something kind of to roll around. I've heard that presented that you know, the, the Levites weren't numbered, so they were you know, they weren't included in this this um, penalty that was been placed on them about where they would fall in the wilderness. Um, the ten spies. What happened to them? Well, let's look at verse thirty-seven. Even those men that did bring up the evil report upon the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were the men that went to search out the land, lived still. So that play, that wasn't pronounced upon them. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, just, just paraphrase the last part of this because it's getting a little late. But um, even though Moses tries to warn these people, you know, God's not with you, don't go up into the land. There were some of them that decided, hey, you know, we're, we understand now. We've sinned. We're going to go up uh, and possess this land. So they try it. And uh, they wind up being defeated terribly. Uh, the, they, they realize that, you know, Moses tells them, look, the Lord's not with you now. Don't go up there. You can't do this. And sure enough, these people were stronger than them. 
and they were defeated greatly. Um, it says, um, but they presumed to go up unto the hill top. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amal Amalekites came down and the Canaanites which dwelt in that hill and smote them and discomforted them even unto Hormah. So these people who thought, well, hey, you know, uh, we realize the error of our way now and we're going to we're going to go up and we're going to take this land. Uh, well, judgment had already fallen and uh, it was too late for them to do that. Um, the, the thing is, uh, as we look at this and we realize that right now is the age of grace. Um, there are, uh, there's an opportunity now to accept Christ as your Savior. Um, the opportunity to go into the promised land was closed for them people right then. Uh, God had already pronounced judgment. There's coming a day when it'll be too late. Judgment is going to be pronounced uh, at your death. You don't have another chance after that. There's no purgatory. You don't have a chance to, to change. You, and when you stand before God at a great white throne of judgment as a lost person, you're going to be a lost person, but you will bow before God. Every knee's going to bow and every tongue's going to confess. And at that point, there will not be any unbelievers. Everyone will be a believer, but it'll be too late as far as salvation is concerned. But right now, you have that opportunity. And just like these people, you don't want to uh, to miss out. They're ch changing a, um, some schedules up at work, and I heard over in the plant, they, um, there was... Uh, somebody who wanted um, like they were going to offer us uh, I think a Friday Saturday day off and a Sunday Monday day off you could have those two days uh, consecutively but you couldn't have Saturday and Sunday you could have Friday and Saturday or Sunday and Monday but you couldn't have Saturday and Sunday uh, because of scheduling reasons and you know, having people there when they needed them uh, it wasn't available and uh, someone decided they wasn't going to sign up for, for one or the other. They were going to kind of rebel a little bit. Um, you know, we have to do things God's way. Uh, what's presented to us is salvation through faith in what Jesus Christ did. That's the way to heaven. Um, and they just told this person, so, well, you know, if, if you uh, refuse these the days that's offered to you, we're passing you over and we're going to the next person in, in the seniority line and you'll have what's left over. And, uh, you know, we don't, salvation wise, we don't want what's left over. What's left over is uh, the lake of fire. You'll be with the devil uh, in the lake of fire eternally, uh, eternally lost. You don't want what's left over. There's, there's an offer made to you right now for, salvation through jesus christ and uh once that once that door of opportunity is closed it's closed forever and that's sad that's serious and it's it's scary to think of being uh lost eternally uh, isolated from god eternally you've never known that and uh, i urge you to, to take advantage Turn your heart over to Jesus Christ. Accept what he has done for the payment of your sins. It's just as simple as that. He's paid all the, the price. You just accept the fact that he's done it for you. And if you, if you make that decision, let us know at the church. Certainly be glad to hear about it. Hope everyone has a good day and a uh, good week. And uh, get off here and get a little rest. So y'all take care. And I appreciate everyone watching these.